I, like many people during this pandemic lockdown, have caught up on a lot of reading. As part of my current research, I've been reading a lot of Iris Murdoch. Iris was one of the most prolific novelists of the 20th century, having written 26 novels, as well as a number of books on philosophy, which was her academic discipline before she turned to fiction. I have been an avid reader of Iris Murdoch since I was a schoolboy, fascinated by her religious sense as much as by her sympathetic portrayal of gay people, especially in an era when such sympathy was swimming against the tide of much public opinion. Iris Murdoch's attitude to religion is somewhat ambivalent and at the same time profound. It is true that many of her novels are peopled by priests and nuns and religious communities and spiritual gurus. And her novels often quote chunks from the Book of Common Prayer, especially the Psalms, and refer to biblical stories. Her religious interest was also supported by a wide reading in theology, and her writing is replete with quotations from many spiritual writers and theologians, including Dame Julian of Norwich, St Augustine, and St Anselm. And yet, for all her religious sensibility, she has been described as an Anglican atheist. In an article for the Paris Review of 1990, she wrote this. I think if we have religion, we shall have to have religion without God, because belief in a personal God is becoming increasingly impossible for many people. I don't believe in the divinity of Christ. I don't believe in life after death. My beliefs are really Buddhist in style. Buddhism makes it clear that you can have religion without believing in God, that religion is in fact better off without God. It has to do with now, with every moment of one's life, how one thinks, what one is and does, about love and compassion and the overcoming of self, the difference between illusion and reality. Although she called herself Buddhist in style, she also described her beliefs in this way in an interview with Jonathan Miller. I still myself use the Christian mythology. I am moved by it, and I see its religious significance and the way in which ordinary life is given a radiance. This ambivalence between belief and unbelief is expressed in many of her novels, and often one feels that the spiritual and theological wrestling of the protagonists in her fiction represents the inner struggle of the author herself. In that struggle, she found a lot of encouragement and inspiration from the work of a remarkable spiritual writer of the 20th century, Simone Weil. One of my favourite quotations from Simone Weil's Waiting on God, which no doubt Iris knew, is this. One can never wrestle enough with God if one does so out of pure regard for the truth. Christ likes us to prefer truth to him, because before being Christ, he is truth. If one turns aside from him towards the truth, one will not go far before falling into his arms. It's as though struggling for the truth is itself a religious pursuit. And it seems as though Iris Murdoch, while sceptical about Christian doctrine, was captivated by the spiritual truth of Christianity and Buddhism too, and the moral precepts religions express. It's as though Iris couldn't be doing with religion, and she couldn't be doing without it either. Iris must have, in her reading of Simone Weil, read the latter's account of an experience of a vision of Christ. Christ himself came down and took possession of me. I had never foreseen the possibility of a real contact person to person here below, between a human being and God. I felt the presence of a love like that which one can read in the smile on a beloved face. I can't think of another author apart perhaps from Dostoevsky, who, without interrupting the flow of the narrative, the plausibility of the plot, or the credibility of the characters, includes a vision of Christ, as Iris Murdoch does in Nuns and Soldiers. 
an extraordinary passage, very reminiscent of the Simon Weil paragraph I have just quoted. Here is Anne Cavage's vision in Iris Murdoch's novel. Anne woke up in her little bed in her new flat and had once remembered the dream. She sat up quickly in bed, filled with a vivid sense of the beauty of the dream and its significance. Then again she became aware. She knew that there was somebody in the next room, somebody standing in her kitchen in the bright light of the early summer morning, and she knew that that person was Jesus. Anne got out of bed and put on her dressing gown and slippers. She felt extreme fear. Then she quietly opened the bedroom door. The kitchen was opposite, across a little landing, and the door was ajar. She pushed open the kitchen door. Jesus was standing beside the table, with a, with a hand resting upon it. Not daring yet to raise her eyes to his face, she saw his hand pressed upon the scrubbed, grainy wood of the table. His hand was pale and bony, the skin rough as if chapped. Then he said her name, Anne. And she raised her eyes and simultaneously fell in her knees on the floor. Jesus was leaning with one hand upon the table and gazing down at her. He had a strangely elongated head and a strange pallor the pallor of something that had long been deprived of light, a shadowed leaf, a deep-sea fish, a grub inside a fruit. He was beardless, with wispy blonde hair, not very long, and he was thin and of medium height, dressed in shapeless yellowish-white trousers and a shirt of similar colour, open at the neck with rolled-up sleeves. He wore plimsolls upon his feet with no socks. Though the shape of the head seemed almost grotesque, the face was beautiful. It did not resemble any painting which Anne had ever seen. The mouth was thoughtful and tender, and the eyes large and remarkably luminous. Anne did not notice all these details at once, but she remembered them well later, except that she could not recall the colour of the eyes. It was a brilliant darkish colour, a sort of blackish or reddish blue, she felt inclined to call it later. Anne felt very afraid, and yet filled with a thrilling, passionate, joyful feeling that passed through her like an electric current, while making her absolutely still. He said again, Anne, sir. Anne had never used this mode of address in her life. Why do I not call him Lord, she wondered. Master, who am I? You are the Christ, she said, the Son of the living God. He said, get up. Iris Murdoch may have distanced herself from realist interpretations of her physical resurrection, but she was not beyond re-inhabiting the doctrine and seeing at least its symbolic and metaphorical significance used without a hint of irony or scepticism, and yet without subverting the novel's plausibility. In the reflections over the past weeks, I am conscious that I have, alongside scripture, quoted or referred to a number of different works of art to illuminate the points I wanted to make. The George Herbert poem, an Elizabeth Frink sculpture, a passage from Wind in the Willows, a bit of T.S. Eliot, and today part of an Iris Murdoch novel. I have done so in the belief that it is through the creative imagination of our artists in whatever medium, as they struggle to articulate what is true and truthful, or as St Paul put it, whatever is true, honourable, just, pure, pleasing and commendable, that we are enabled to come close to the Christ who before being Christ is truth, or as St John put it, who is the true and living way. You are the Christ, she said, the Son of the living God. And so let us pray for our world and its need. 
all who are suffering from the global pandemic and those who are mourning the death of loved ones, to the medics and carers who nurse them, and the support workers who keep the essential infrastructure of society go going even during this lockdown period. We remember those who are anxious, afraid or vulnerable. And we also pray and give thanks for the creative gifts of artists and sculptors, poets and novelists, playwrights, musicians and dancers, and all who through their skill and talent inspire and recreate our humanity, especially in times of darkness. Here is a prayer which for all its simplicity may encourage us to give thanks for the simple things of life which we all too often ignore or take for granted. Think freely, practice patience, smile often, savour special moments, live God's message, make new friends, discover old ones, tell those you love that you do, feel deeply, forget trouble, forgive an enemy, pick some daisies, share them, keep a promise, Look for rainbows, gaze at stars, see beauty everywhere, work hard, be wise, try to understand, take time for people, make time for yourself. Laugh heartily, spread joy, take a chance, reach out, let someone in, try something new, slow down. Be soft sometimes. Celebrate life. Believe in yourself. Trust others. See a sunrise. Listen to rain. Reminisce. Cry when you need to. Eternal God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, grant us to walk in his way to rejoice in his truth and to share his risen life. He is alive and reigns now and forever.